Acts 27. Acts 27, beginning reading in verse 1. Scripture says, when it was decided that we would sell for Italy, they proceeded to deliver Paul and some other prisoners to a centurion of the Augustan co cohort named Julius, and embarking in an Adramidium ship, which was about to sail to the regions along the coast of Asia, we put out to sea accompanied by Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica. The next day we put in at Sidon, and Julius treated Paul with consideration and allowed him to go to his friends and receive care. From there we put out to sea and sailed under the shelter of Cyprus because the winds were contrary. When we had sailed through the sea along the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we landed at Myra and Lycia. There the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing for Italy, and he put us aboard it. When we had sailed slowly for a good many days and with difficulty had arrived off Nidus, since the wind did not permit us to go further, we sailed under the shelter of Crete of Salmone and met with, with difficulty sailing past it. We came to a place called Fair Havens, near which was the city of Lycia. Let's pray. Lord, as we look at this chapter, we realize that you work in the, in the details of life uh, to work out your sovereign purpose and will. And we know you did that with Paul, Lord. We know even though difficult things will happen in this chapter, we know you're able to overcome these things and work through these things and, and get your man where you want him to be. And we know that your sovereign purpose is fulfilled. We pray today as, as we hear your word that we will uh, be, uh, bow under the authority of it, we'll submit to it, that we will, uh, believers will respond to it today. We pray, pray for those who are unbelievers today, that they will respond to the gospel of Christ. Pray for Mike as he preaches your word. Your blessing might be upon him today. We pray that Christ would be exalted. In Christ's name, amen. Good morning, everyone. Good to see everybody today. We have someone with the gift of announcements, I think. Uh, praise the Lord. Thankful for Timmy's participation. Today we're going to get a first-hand look at how God's sovereignty and human responsibility work together. This passage reveals God's sovereign authority over everything, including the winds and nature and the waves and the storms of life, literally the storms that come into our world. It also reveals that God works His plan through man's choices. I think sometimes we who are in the reform camp are afraid to say man's choices have consequences. We subtly fall into hyper-Calvinism. We state things like, I did something wrong, but God was sovereign over my choices. He's sovereign. While this is true in the greater picture of God's ordained perspective and His plan, in the working out of God's plan, we are still responsible for the choices we make. In other words, if we get a speeding ticket, God is sovereign, but we made the choice to speed. We can often use our knowledge of God's sovereignty as an excuse for our wrong choices. Thus, we fail to acknowledge our own sinfulness in our wrong choices and decisions. It's very important that we understand that God's sovereignty works through our responsible choices and our decisions. He works His plan through those decisions. Both are true. We're going to see that sometimes God steps in to protect us from our foolish decisions. And everybody in the room says, Amen. But other times, He allows us to make foolish decisions to comp accomplish an even bigger goal or purpose. And in fact, sometimes He allows us to suffer at the hands of other people's foolish decisions so that He can accomplish something in us and for His glory. Either way, we need to own our mistakes and learn from them and submit to authorities in our life even if we don't like the decisions they sometimes make. In this case, it causes a shipwreck and a swim to shore. 
and 14 days of seasickness because an authority above them makes a wrong decision. But God was working. I want to give a few cautions concerning this passage before we study it. First, remember, Paul was an apostle and you aren't. I know you've heard this before, but here it is very important. He got special revelation from God, not once, but probably three times on this trip. You can't say, God says, don't go. Or God says, you're going to be rescued. He got special revelation. He's an apostle. We're not. Contrary to some people that say the apostles are still around, that's a gift that has gone away. It was part of the foundation of the church. We don't have this benefit. Yes, we have God's word, but we don't have special revelation of what's going to happen in the future. And though many people claim to have been visited by angels, I think that God keeps us from knowing that we have been visited by angels. Maybe un angels unaware, but Definitely not angels coming to us and talking to us and telling us what's going to happen in the future. I don't think that otherwise that would be extra revelation or special revelation. Second, we need to be careful of using a story like this to give license to our interpretation, our own interpretation of our own trials. For example, we sometimes get ourselves into jams and then we cry this is happening to me because I'm being hurt by others because they don't listen to God. The fact is, many of our trials are self-inflicted messes. Make sure you note that. God may be working in His providence to discipline us to be more obedient to Him. Don't just apply this passage and say, see, I'm on a ship to Rome again with a bunch of boneheads. So we need to learn to take our spankings and learn from those spankings and don't make those same mistakes again, like getting ourselves in debt up to our eyeballs with credit card debt because we think, I've got to have that TV now, and then later saying, those credit card companies, they're just out to get me. That's not how to get you. You couldn't say no. You couldn't be responsible and say, I don't have to have this right now until I can afford it. It would be great if maybe we just bought a $200 TV instead of a $1,500 TV and put it on credit. Again, don't use this story to justify your own messes. God is sovereign over your messes. Yes. But own them <laughs> and take the discipline that you may incur, incur. Paul's not in that circumstance, folks. He's in a different one. He's in one where people are going to make bad decisions and he just has to ride it out. Some of you ladies in the room, you may have to ride out some of these decisions <laughs> that your husbands make that you don't really think is wise. We've had one in our own family. I'm going to go ahead and bring it up, even, say, even though you said not to. I'm going against her wisdom. The dog. She told me, don't get the dog. And I have regretted the dog for a year and a half now. <laughs> it was sitting there biting her as we were looking at this cute little puppy. And I, we thought it was great, but it was a bad decision. It wasn't a wise one. But we love our dog, don't we, kids? There we go, Caleb. Yeah, we love that dog. God's working to spite us, isn't he? I think the most important thing that we can learn from this story is God is always working out his sovereign plan, but it often looks messy from our perspective. As he's working out his sovereign plan, we look around and we say, man, this world's a mess. Boy, the circumstances are horrible. It looks like everything's going bad, but in fact, God's working. And everybody in the room that's a believer says what? Praise God, right? Amen. Glad he's on, in control. So, let's walk down through this passage and see these two truths work out together to accomplish God's plan to get Paul to Rome. 
First, there's the journey begins. Mark read this very well. There's a couple notes that I want you to note. In this first section, we see some decisions are made that help prepare the Apostle Paul for the long journey, the long, difficult journey. First, there is the stop in Sidon in verse 3. It was here that Paul, the prisoner, is given special treatment by the centurion Julius. Prisoners were not normally given this kind consideration for their captors. I, I asked the death this morning, have, if you were going to a jail in a, in a police car, you were headed to, a poli- uh, to, to the jail or the prison in a police car, how many of the police are, would stop over at somebody's house and just let you go in and get refreshed before you went off to the jail? Never. It doesn't happen. Why did it happen here? Short answer, God. God was working through this unbelieving centurion to get Paul prepared for what? A pretty hard trip to come. And it appears in verse 3 that he received care. The way this is worded is most likely Paul was sick to a degree. He might have had a, 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 a virus of some sort, needed some help, and needed some extra fluids and, and some help. So it, it looks like he had a sickness that ends up getting him some special care, which helps to prepare him for what? A 14-day journey where he's going to be sick, seasick for a long time, and then he's going to have to swim to shore. So he needed this refreshment, and God was preparing the way. It could have, why did it happen? Why did the centurion do it? Well, we're not told in this passage why. It could have been anything like Festus and King Agrippa telling him, hey, treat this guy good, he's, a, he's innocent. Or it could have been Paul had spent some time on the way to Sidon talking to the centurion and the centurion says, hey, this guy's pretty friendly. There's nothing wrong with this guy. I like him. And he lets him go and trust him. There's no evidence really, but ultimately we say who's in control. God is. God was working. Also, we see at the beginning in this, of this journey, the sovereign God who controls the weather makes the trip take longer. We see this in verses 4 and 5. Now, we're going to have a lot of maps, but I want you to take note of something here. What is the shortest way to Rome? Well, it's that way. Where did they end up going? They ended up going this way. Even if they were going to Myra and were going to go directly there, it would be a lot quicker to go that way, right? Well, why did they go around? And why? This would take much longer. And you're going to see this. It would make, take much longer to go that way than just a direct shot. The answer is God was having a wind. There was a wind and they were going, it was going against them, so they stayed close to the shore. What does that mean? It took longer. Why is that important? Well, here's why it's important. And this is very important, or very uh, important for you to understand. Folks, it appears that it's a little bit, it's probably around July or August at this point. They need to get to Rome before winter. If they don't get to Rome before winter, it's going to be a long, hard trip through the Mediterranean Sea. Or they're going to need to stop somewhere and wait. So, what are they thinking? The captain's thinking, well, we can't go. The centurion's saying, we've got to go to Rome. Most likely, they would want to hug this way and go towards Rome, but it's already taken longer. When it takes longer, that means danger is coming. Again, already in the events, we see that God is working, but it often looks messy from our perspective. This wouldn't have been the first choice. This wouldn't have been the way to go, but events are happening and you can't do anything about it. But God is working. Just a side note, I'm pretty sure if the centurion was told that he would, what he was going to face in the next month or two on this ship, I'm fairly sure, guess what he would have done? Let's go on land. <laughs> Let's don't go this way. But often God shows, doesn't show us, rather, our future because he knows if we see our future, what's going to happen? We're chicken out. We wouldn't go. How many of you want to know what's going to happen tomorrow? I don't. I don't want to know what happens next week, a month from now, 
Do you? I don't. Beloved, this is how God works. He keeps the future from us for our good. And it teaches us to do what? Trust him. Trust him. So the journey has begun. Next we see a new sea vessel is given. A new sea vessel. In verses 6 to 10, it says there, the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing for Italy, and he put us aboard it. When we had sailed slowly for a good many days and with difficulties had arrived off of Snidus, since the wind did not permit us to go further or farther, we sailed under the shelter of Crete, off Salomon. And with difficulty sailing past it, we came to a place called Fairhaven, near which was the city of Lycia. When the considerable time had passed, that could have been a month or two, the voyage was now dangerous, since even the fast was already over. The fast being the Day of Atonement, most likely, and this is, in this year, in 59, would have been around October. Paul began to admonish them and said to them, Men, this is very important, Men, I perceive that the voyage will certainly be with damage and great loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. So, what do we have? Now the journey from Myra to Fairhaven. Let's look back at the map again. Again, if you were at Myra and you wanted to go to Rome, you would go by Snidus and stay and hug the coast and go that way. But what happens? Another wind. This time the wind does what? It pushes them down towards Crete. That is bad, ladies and gentlemen. That is a very bad direction to go. Let me explain why. See this place right here? That's the Mediterranean Sea. And after a fast is winter. You know what happens there? Ships there crash. <laughs> People die. You don't want to be in the Mediterranean in the middle of winter. It's ugly, especially in a wooden ship. So what's happened? As we see, the wind causes them to go south towards Crete. Okay? Who's in control of the wind? God. Where does God want him to be? Rome. However, he is picking a fast way. A quick course. But it's also going to be a very painful way. It's going to be a very ugly way. Look what happens when they get there. The winds were not permitting them to go. And we sailed under the shelter of Crete, we get down under Crete, and with great difficulty past it, past the end area, Salome is down over here, when they get past that, they land in this city of Fairhaven. Now look at verse, we get a very important note in verse 9, it says, since even the fast was over, again that's October, look what Paul says. Paul says in verse 10, Men, I perceive that the voyage will certainly be with damage and great loss, and not only our, of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. Folks, what we're going to see here is, is that God gave special revelation to the Apostle Paul of the trip that's going to happen. Again, this isn't like when my wife said, let's don't get this dog. Okay, That was a wise decision, a wise thing to say, let's don't get this dog, let's get a smaller dog, because you... It won't hurt you. But this is the Apostle Paul speaking. And the Apostle Paul got what? Direct revelation from God. God had given him a brief preview of what was going to happen. And it was going to be bad. They were going to lose what? L cargo of the ship. And guess what's going to happen? Exactly that. So, this was special revelation. And it included the loss that was coming. Some people have asked me, well, how can this be special revelation? Did any life, or it's any life lost on the trip? If you know Acts 27, did any, were any lives lost in the trip? No, there wasn't. 
All 276 men make it. They swim. So did, did he miss it here? I would argue no. I think the direction they were headed was catastrophe. It was going that way. And you say, well, what would that be like? Well, it would be very similar to Jonah. You all know the story of Jonah. You remember the story of Jonah. What happens to Nineveh? Well, Jonah goes into Nineveh and he says, what's going to happen in 40 days? Destruction, right? Everybody's going to die. God's going to bring judgment on this place in 40 days. Did judgment happen? No, it didn't. Does that mean that God missed it or God's prophet missed it? No, he was given a warning that the direction you're going is headed towards what? Catastrophe. And unless there's an intervention, you're going to do what? Die. But ultimately, God ordained for what? Their repentance so that they wouldn't die. Okay? But he gives the warning to what? Cause the people to see and fear God so they will turn to him. Correct? The same thing happens back in our story here. Paul says there's going to be loss. There's going to be lots of loss. And there's going to be loss of life. Now what's that mean? What should that have been? This is a warning. Guess what? If we make this choice, we're going to what? Die. There's going to be somebody that dies. But there was an intervention. Who was the one that intervened for them? Paul does. And God ordained his prayers. We'll see in a little bit. What happens is, is Paul steps in, petitions for the whole 276 people. And God grants that to them. But this also sets up for later so that when they look back, they say, oh yeah, you did know what was going to happen. We better listen to you. So all of this is part of God's sovereign plan. Isn't that good news? God knew exactly what was going to happen. God was using his spokesman perfect, his messenger. Either way, what do we see again? God is working, but it often looks messy from our perspective. Third, notice as they leave Fairhaven, they shouldn't have left Fairhaven, but they did. Following the majority brings what? Big trouble. <laughs> Following the majority brings big trouble. Look at verses 11 to 17. But the centurion was more persuaded by the pilot and the captain of the ship than by what was being said by Paul. Because the harbor was not suitable for wintering, the majority reached a decision to put out to sea from there. If somehow they could reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete, facing southwest and northwest, and spend the winter there, when a moderate south wind came, upon, uh, came up, supposing that they had attained their purpose, they weighed anchor and began sailing along Crete, close in shore. But... Before very long, there rushed down from the land a violent wind called the Uroquillo. And when the ship was caught in it and could not face the wind, we gave way to it and let ourselves be driven along. Running under the shelter of a small island called Clotta, we were scarcely able to get the ship's boat under control. After they hoisted it up, they used supporting cables in undergirding the ship and fearing that they might run aground on the shallows of Sisterus, they let down the sea anchor and in this way let themselves be driven along. There's a very important word in here and it's found at the beginning of verse 11. If you look back, it's the word but. This is one of those buts in scripture that you don't want. It was going against the revelation of God. This is not a good one. This is somebody saying, hmm, I think I'll go with what we think's best. Ugliness is coming because of that contrast. The pilot and the captain convinced the centurion to move on to Phoenix. If you look back at, look at our map, 
Most likely we're at Fairhaven here. Paul's saying what? Stay at Fairhaven. Stay here. It's going to be bad. They say, no, we don't want to stay here. It's not a good place to winter the boat. It's not a good port. It would be a lot less populated in Fairhaven, a lot less things to do. It would be uncomfortable to stay in Fairhaven. Let's stay in Phoenix instead. And so what do they think? What does the captain say? Let's go to Phoenix. What does the centurion say? Let's go to Phoenix. What does the majority say? Let's go to Phoenix. <laughs> now let me ask you a question. Was it a wise decision? Was it a wise decision? Yes and no. It was a wise decision if you're a captain and you know the water, you know where it's best to win winter your ship, you know what's best, right? You know you can keep it along the shore. You've done this probably many times. You know where you are. You know the area. You know how to do it. Is it a wise decision? The majority are going with it. Everybody says, yes. But what made it unwise? One thing. God's messenger told you it's going to be bad. <laughs> Don't do it. The word of God, in the same way, tells us don't do something. Some of the world can tell you. The majority can tell you. Everybody can tell you. Go ahead. It's not that bad. Beloved, always go with the messenger of God. Go with what God's word says. Don't go with the majority decision. But God was still sovereign. It's very important for you to understand. That though they said, let's go to Phoenix, by the way, they never got to Phoenix, did they? No, the reason why is as soon as they set out this way, a wind comes and drives them this way. Where is it driving them? It's driving them right out into the area that they're not supposed to be in the middle of a winter storm. Things are going to get bad, but they don't listen. And they keep going. Just a side note for us here, for application. Sometimes you may be in a position where you think it's not, not wise to go on, yet an authority in your life says go on anyway. What do you do? Well, what you do is you throw a temper tantrum. Scream at the top of your lungs. I'm not going to die with you. No way. That was sarcasm. Don't do that. The Apostle Paul doesn't appear to do this, does he? What happens? He goes on. He accepts it. He, he goes with it. He knows God's in control, and he trusts. Who was the authority? The captain and the centurion. So which direction did they go? With them. The majority picked it. And the missionaries suffered for it. I think this is important for us to understand. We don't throw temper tantrums if our authority above us gives us a decision to do that we don't like. Correct? Folks, this really does apply, doesn't it? There's many areas where it applies. We need to look at our lives and realize that people that are above us, they might make bad decisions, unwise decisions, but guess what? We submit to those authorities anyway. Unless they tell us to do what? Sin against God. But you say, wait, God's given a special revelation through Paul. Is it a sin? I don't think it's a sin. I don't think he's saying, do not go. He's saying, guess what? It's going to be bad if we go. It's going to be bad. Fact of the matter is, is none of us in here get the special revelation like the Apostle Paul too, right? By the way, just uh, this is like really important for marriages in the room that you understand that the husband is not the Apostle Paul. Okay, you understand you're not. You don't have special revelation with, from God on decisions on whether you should buy something or not. If, if your husband says, God told me to get this, 
say, you need to talk to the <laughs> to Pastor Mike. Because <laughs> it don't work that way. Okay? However, if, listen closely, if your husband decides to go ahead and do something, okay, listen closely, your husband decides to go ahead and do something, and you give that nice, gentle, loving warning, <laughs> oh, please, let's not buy that house now because we can't afford the payment. That's one of those times, husbands, that you should go, hmm, did God put me with this woman to protect me? Maybe I should listen to her. You with me? However, ladies, what should you do? At the end of the day, you say, well, if you pray and I'm praying, you make the decision, we're going with you. And when the storm comes, ride it out with them. Don't throw them under the bus or over, overboard. I've had enough of you for a husband. I'll find one that doesn't run me into, into storms. Does everybody understand? We trust God. We follow our roles. We honor the king. Even when the authorities above us take us into storms. Okay? Great, great, great application, isn't it? On the flip side, some of you may even think it's best to move on because the next situation is safer and better for us, but you get wise counsel to stay and to be content. What do we do? I mean, these guys got wise counsel. Let's go up and winter up in Phoenix. It's wise counsel. What should they have done? Well, they should have fell on their faces and say, hey, we got a problem. God, help us. Give revelation. Give us wisdom. Don't seek counsel, by the way. This is something that we all need to learn. Don't seek counsel that tells us what we want to hear. Do you understand, folks, when you're making decisions? Oh, we do this, don't we? I, I, I love this. People come up to me. I've had, I, especially some of you young people, I love you. I'm just, I'm just telling you, it's, it's, it cracks me up. Somebody comes up to me and says, I've made a decision to do this. And I'm like, Okay. Who did you talk to? Well, I talked to so and so and so and so and so and so. Do, are they believers? Do, do they go to church? Why didn't you come talk to me? Or Mark or, or one of the deacons or somebody at the church? And then they, because they gave me this great advice. And they said, I was right. Ah. You sought counsel that you liked. You sought counsel from somebody that would tell you what you wanted to hear. You sought counsel from somebody that you knew you could manipulate into giving you the answer you wanted. That hasn't ever happened to any of us in the room, has it? Oh, beloved, listen to me. <laughs> Don't be afraid to seek counsel from somebody that will actually tell you what you don't want to hear. They might actually help you. Do you all understand, beloved? The Apostle Paul knew what to do, didn't he? Stay in Fairhaven. But instead they chose the other way. So what happens? Phoenix is never visited, and before they know it, they're down, headed into the Uroquillo, a huge hurricane-like wind storm that was going to toss them all over the Mediterranean Sea. And I, I tried to get into in, in the picture a little bit. I watched a couple of YouTube videos of like the 10 worst cruise ship uh, videos of going in waves. I'll tell you what, those poor people, did you see that a while back ago about the cruise ship? that was taken in, got into one of those storms and they took pictures inside the, <laughs> inside the cabin or inside the eating area and all the tables were going from one side to the other and people were flying across the screen back and forth. Oh, I can't even comprehend that. 
Can you imagine how many times the Apostle Paul <laughs> sat in that boat going, man, why did they listen to me? <laughs> why did we stay? Fourteen days, ladies and gentlemen, they were in this boat going up and down, up and down. Now, this was a wheat carrying ship from Alexandria. From Egypt, that's where wheat came. They would take it up there and then cut across and go to Rome. They had plenty of food, ladies and gentlemen. We know this because at the end, they do what? They throw the wheat out. They had plenty of food. But it says they did not eat for 14 days. Why didn't they eat? Because they were holding on for dear life. And they were probably all seasick. I don't know about you. How many of you, just by chance, how many of you have been seasick before? Raise your hand. Oh, good. I would, I would compare, again, I haven't been pregnant, but I've heard that morning sickness has got the same kind of feeling where you feel like your stomach is, and you turn, it was funny because the death said, you're green. Exactly. That gives it. Can you imagine being on this ship? Uh-uh. Uh-uh. Now, how many times do you think you would have thrown yourself on the bottom of the ship and said, or on the floor and said, Captain, you got us in this mess. What are you doing? Doesn't appear that happens. Now, he does say it one time, we'll see, the Apostle Paul, but I think he's got a reason behind saying it, and we'll see it in a second. At the same time, God and his sovereignty is working out the details, isn't he? And at this point, he, see, there's this little island right here, Kata, or Kuda, or whatever. And as the, as the storm tosses them this way, they get from about here to here. Sorry, my hand's shaking a little bit. But they get that little bit of space behind that island to do what? Throw a bunch of straps under the ship real quick. Because guess what's going to happen? It's going to get really bad, and they know it. So God in his sovereignty has them sail right by this little island to get protection. But they were afraid. They were afraid of this area right here. Why were they afraid of this? Because thousands of ships had crashed in that area. And when you get into that wind and that kind of storm in the middle of winter, guess what happens? You die in this area off the coast. It runs you aground, and everybody dies. So they were afraid of this. Now, I love what you see next, though. Though the circumstances are impossible, God's still working. Let's look at the next details. In verses 18, many days wishing they were dead. Here we go. Here's the green section. The next day, as we were being violently storm-tossed, they began to jettison the cargo. Up. Oh. What's happening? Prophecy fulfilled. They're throwing the stuff overboard. And on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. Since neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small storm was assailing us. From then on, all hope of our being saved was gradually abandoned. Oh, this is amazing, isn't it? I don't know about all of y'all, but I don't want to be in this ship. <laughs> I would never pick to be on this journey. Anybody? No way, right? By the way, just a side note. Have you ever found yourself in some of these journeys? <laughs> Maybe not like this, but the same things are happening. Wrong decisions are being made by people in authority above you, and you find yourself not going to the bathroom at Target. Decisions are being made by authorities above us, and we don't like it. But we deal with it. What do we do? We throw a temper tantrum. No. We mock the authorities above us. No. We graciously sit under them and realize that God's in control of even this mess. God is working. God is working. It looks messy around us. 
but God is working. And that's exactly what's happening with these poor guys. They're afraid. All hope is gone. But that's exactly where God wanted these men. They were right where he wanted them. Why? Because where do you turn when there's no hope? You turn and look up. And you say, I need God. And guess what happens? That's what happens. Especially the centurion. This is a lesson in God's control, and it's a lesson for all of us to know that no matter where our circumstances are, our hope is not found in this world and in this messy situation we're in. Our hope is found where? In the God who controls the winds. Praise God, right? Then we see the words of encouragement come from the Apostle Paul. Again, it starts with a little, uh, uh, I told you so at the beginning. When they had gone a little time without food, or a long time without food, 14 days apparently, as we'll read on. Then Paul stood up in their midst and said, Men, you ought to have followed my advice and not have set sail for Crete and incurred this damage and loss. What was this? This was the I told you so. Right? Now, I want to take one note before I move on. This I told you so is not a slap. This I told you so has purpose behind it, and it's good purpose. Let me explain what the good purpose is. When we say I told you so, often when we say I told you so, it's to what? Mock those in authority above us to say, I knew better than you. That's not what he's saying. We're not trying to mock. He wasn't trying to mock the, uh, the centurion. He wasn't trying to degrade him, make him feel an uh, inch high. He was trying to set them up to see and understand, I know where we're going. And I know the God that's in control. And that God's given me special revelation. And guess what? You're not going to die. That's good news. I've got your back. In fact, in fact, look how he's got their back. Look at verse 22. Yet now I urge you to keep up your courage, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. Oh, that's really encouraging. For this very night an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve, wow, isn't that great, stood before me. Saying, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar and behold, God, key phrase, look at this phrase. God has granted you all those who are sailing with you. Therefore, keep up your courage, men, for I believe God, that it will turn out exactly as I have been told, but we must run aground on a certain island. What happened, folks? Look what happened. The whole ship, or at least the centurions, look at Paul and say what? Paul's got my back. What does that God has granted to you mean? It implies what? A gracious gift from God. Why would he give a gracious gift to, God, uh, to Paul of these 276 men? Now think about this for a second. You got to get this. Folks, listen to me. Paul wasn't on the ship going along the way going, I told them not to go out here. I told them not to go out there. I wish these people would just get their due. I hope I don't get punished along the way, and I hope I don't die. But, you know, if you take a couple of the 276, that's okay. They asked for it. What was Paul doing along the way? He was praying for them. He was seeking God for the 276 majority that said, let's go into this mess. Ah, oh, there's so many amazing applications for all of us here. Isn't there? Just let your, just think about this for a second. 
Instead of throwing them under the bus, he was bringing them before the king, saying, save them. Save them. But we don't think this way, do we? We think I deserve better than a leader like this. I deserve to be treated better than this. God, change the leader for me so I can have somebody better. Isn't that the way we think? But you got the Apostle Paul that's more concerned for those 276 men. Okay, who cares about the cargo? Who cares about the ship? Just want these guys to make it. And what's it do? It sets up this beautiful picture to the centurion that looks at Paul at the end when they're about to kill Paul. And he says what? Uh -uh, Uh-uh, uh-uh. Ain't killing that guy. Y'all aren't getting out of here either. You'll see it. It's all beautiful. I'm almost convinced the centurion gets saved. Don't have all the details, but it sure looks like it. He completely submits to what the Apostle Paul says from the whole rest of the trip. He stops listening to the captain. He stops listening to the leading soldiers. It appears that he gets it. These are some encouraging words, aren't they? What a trip. Three parts to his message were a reminder. He knew what was going to happen before. And it's because God had given me information, so listen to me. Listen to the revelation of God's word. Second, a revelation, angel of God has given me the one that I belong to, the one that I'm owned by, and the one that I serve. And so I'm speaking as a representative of him. Does that matter, by the way? Huge. Oh, it's gigantic. You know, people get on to us, and and we think, well, people hate us because we serve Jesus. Do you know, when you get right down to it, if you were in a, in a street fight or uh, something bad was going to happen, somebody was coming after you, people want to serve the one that's serving the one true God. They want to go with him. You know why? Because that person is known. They know God. They know God. Everybody knows there is a God. They know that God controls everyone. And if anybody's associated with them, what are they going to do? I want to hang with that guy. Even unbelievers. You know that, right? How many of you have had your relatives, you've, you've, you've witnessed to some of your relatives, and it seems like they just don't get it, and they, they disagree with you. And they even get angry at you occasionally. And they start, start mocking you. You know who they call when they're facing death? You. You know who they call when their life becomes a mess? You. Why? Because you belong to God and you're serving him and they know it. They know that you really have their back. And that's what's happened with the Apostle Paul. Now, if you really don't have their back and you're just a Christian by name only, then they probably won't come to you. But isn't this beautiful? I love this story. I love these events. It's amazing. And so what happens? After the words of encouragement, and they're drifting along in the Mediterranean Sea, they panic. Sets in. Panic as land ahead is realized in verses 28 and 32. They took soundings in verse 28. And found it to be 20 fathoms. And a little further on, they took another sounding and found it to be 15 fathoms. Fearing that we we might run aground somewhere on the rocks, they cast forth anchors from the stern and wished for daybreak. But as the sailors were trying to escape from the ship, on the dinghies most likely, or like it, had let down the ship's boat into the sea, and on the pretense of intending to lay out anchors from the bow, Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, Unless these men remain in the ship, you yourselves cannot be saved. Then the soldiers did what? Cut away the ropes of the ship's boat and let it fall away. 
What happened? They were coming along and coming up into Malta. They start realizing they're getting close. And again, who's in control? God's in control. He gives special revelation to Paul again. It looks messy because the sailors sought to abandon ship. The captain and all them, hey, let's get off this boat. It's going down. Let's take the what? The little boat and get out of here. So they attempt to jump ship in the lifeboat, for lack of a better term. But now the centurion who was all in for the Apostle Paul says what? Ah! Because the Apostle Paul stands up and gives special revelation again. Hey, if they leave, we're dead. Again, it's a hairy situation. The direction looks like this. If they leave, the direction is death. I don't think we need to cut the ropes, though, right? Did they need to cut the ropes? And No, I wish they wouldn't have cut the ropes. It would have been better for those they didn't have to swim the whole way at the end. But the reaction is what? Nobody's getting off the ship. We're all going down together. God was working, but it looked messy to the very end of the trip. And finally, we see the last day on the ship. Actually, not finally. Close, though. Hang in there. Verse 33. Until the day was about to dawn, Paul was encouraging them all to take some food, saying, Today is the 14th day that you have been constantly watching and going without eating. They've been starving, and they're green. Having taken nothing, therefore I encourage you to take some food, for this is for your preservation. For not a hair from the head of any of you will perish. Having said this, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of all. And he broke it and began to eat. And all of them were encouraged. And they themselves also took food. All of us in the ship were 276 persons. When they had eaten enough, they began to lighten the ship by throwing out the wheat into the sea. Man, do you think they... I think everybody got it. I think pretty much everybody was getting it. How do we know? Well, because they threw the, sh the wheat over. It says they were encouraged. They're starting to get it. Once again, oh, isn't this beautiful? Isn't this a perfect picture of how God's own step out at those moments when the trials and everything is going crazy and they step up and do the thing that's totally contrary to the way the world would think. The ship is going down. Everything is bad. We know this is going to happen. They've cut away the lifeboat. This is not going to be pretty. And Paul steps up and says, hey, we need to eat something. We need to eat something. And then we need to praise God and thank him for what he's given us. And he gives all glory to God. What a beautiful picture, isn't it? What a God. He's sustaining them all the way through, using God's man to accomplish this. Oh, folks, please apply this to your life. Please understand that the storms and the trials and the messiness is all a beautiful place for the glory of God to be on display in your life. Do you understand? If it wasn't messy, they wouldn't know what it looks like to have faith in God in the mess. It's got to be messy. Our lives have got to be like, whoa, why is it happening like this? So that we will continue to do what? God, we need you. Thank God. I'll never forget last year. We'll close with this. We went on, a, we went on our vacation. And you all remember the, a little bit of the story, how, oh, how bad it was. It was the first day was just unbelievable. Driving down 270 or uh, uh, down 75, and all of a sudden look back, and our back tire is on fire. Like, uh oh, pull over quick! So we pull over, and the tire is smoking really bad, and we don't have a spare for the trailer. So what do we do? Well, we go five miles an hour to the next exit, and every once in a while, slow down and stop and throw a little bit of water on it to cool it down. Finally get there and found a great, God provided a great guy to change the tire. It was wonderful. $400 later, 
approximately, but got a new tire. And in the process, what do we do? We praise God. We're like, thank you, God, and waited five hours more. Then we got back in the car and we started driving again. And when we got back on the road, what happened? Well, we got there and it started raining just in time to drop the boat in. And as we were going along in the boat, cruising along real well, it started really raining. And everything is, you know, rain in a boat going fast is not fun. And all of a sudden, we the back of the engine. And I run up onto a sandbar because I'm rushing. And the boat motor just goes like that. Yes, and you can see it on our prop. It's completely mangled. Needless to say, a guy, gracious guy, while it's storming, and by the way, at this point, I wasn't thanking the Lord, but I should have been. A guy shows up with a big ski do and says, I can pull you off. Great. Thank you, Lord, for sending this guy. He puts the rope on the back of the boat and starts pulling it. And, of course, what happens? The rope gets hung up in the guy's motor and ruins his ski do, too. I'm like, oh, how much is that going to cost me? Oh, don't worry. I've done this before. I can fix it. Don't worry. I won't pay, charge you anything. Another guy pulls up and pulls us off. This is great. Thank you, Lord. By this time, the kids are going crazy. It's a mess. It's a disaster. Give up. Go home. Forget it. It's only going to get better. So we get the boat off, finally go pick up my wife, get over there, and we start driving into the place where we're supposed to stay. As I pull the boat up where the dock is to look at this beautiful little condo that has been given or let us use for a week or two weeks, and it looks really it's a good price, cheap, it's very nice. This guy's very gracious to us to give a real good price. Look up on there, and there's somebody sitting in the chairs. <laughs> it's 8 o'clock at night. Or 7 o'clock, somewhere like that. Oh, no. I call the owner. Hey, what's going on? We're here to stay at the place. Oh, you're not. There's somebody already there. We've double booked you. What am I supposed to do? He's going to be there for another three days. Disaster after disaster after disaster after disaster. And I, I started laughing. <laughs> this is great, Lord. You are so good. Way to go, God. This is so wonderful. After a couple phone calls to the owner, we stayed in a hotel that we would have never stayed at and we will never stay at again in the history of the world. <laughs> Not because it wasn't the finest place I've ever stayed in in my life, which it was very close. Nice place. But the $300 a night is just a little steep for our budget. Thankfully, the owner said he'd pay half. We stayed there for three days. What did we learn out of the whole situation? God is sovereign. God is good. Thankfully, we had enough saved to be able to handle it. But it was messy along the way. Even those. By the way, these, uh, just a good, this is a good illustration. This is a, a backup illustration. All of you that have children, we like our children in here. And there is nothing wrong with that. Okay? If a child cries, guess what? A child cries. You will be okay. I love you, okay? It's okay if they cry a little bit. That's called a divine interruption. <laughs> and it's okay. This is exactly what this trip's all about, right? Beloved, God is in control, but it looks like messy to us. It looks like a mess to us often. But what do we do? We trust the Lord. We keep going. And what happens? Sometimes the ship crashes, next last section, and we have to swim to shore. 
But guess what? God takes care of his own. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day and this passage and these events. And God, we thank you that you used Luke to record this beautiful picture to help us to understand how you are in control of all events. Help us, Lord, to trust you. Help us not to mock those in authority over us when they make wrong decisions. Help us to be gracious and kind and honoring and respectful. And at the same time, Lord, we pray that you help us to make wise decisions, to always submit to your word first and foremost. And Lord, as we go about this life, we understand that we fall and fail and mess up and make mistakes and sin continuously. And so what are we? We're here, God, to say we need you. We know our hope is only in you. We pray that you will give us help, help us to hold on when it seems impossible. Please encourage our souls when we become hopeless. And Father, I pray that if there's anyone in here that is trying to run their life by themselves, that they will surrender now to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. That they will find that their hope is not found in themselves, but their hope is found in the sovereign God who sent his son to die in their place and rise from the dead. God, give us Christ. Give us more of Jesus. Help us to trust you. Be our vision constantly. We pray this in the matchless name of Jesus our Savior.